Okay, so as I just said, this is going to be a fantastic workshop. We're going to be looking at Caravaggio once again. And this is going to be a very different series because we are going to look at, across the three parts in this new series on Caravaggio, his entire career. Okay, so we're going to look across the entire uh, span of Caravaggio's life. He's born in 1571 and he dies in 1610. And so with, but within that brief career, he creates some of the most epochally influential paintings. And out of all of the painters of the 17th century, he can quite plausibly be called the most important and the most influential and the most transformative for the development of European painting. So he's perhaps the most influential painter of the entire 17th century, even though he dies in, seven, in 1610. So just at the end of the first decade of the 17th century, Caravaggio dies, and yet his legacy and his profound impact was felt by every painter since. The works that he produced in his brief career impacted the course and development of painting so profoundly that it's impossible to appreciate the work of any subsequent 17th century painter without some account of Caravaggio's influence on them. Okay, so his impact on artists like Rembrandt, like Velasquez, like Franz Haus, has really got to be part of the discussion you have when you're trying to understand the significance of their work. So an entire school of Dutch golden age painting is named after him, the Caravaggisti. There's an art movement in the Netherlands in the wake of Caravaggio, which started during his lifetime. That's how famous he became during his life as well. And these, this movement included great painters like Hendrik de Bruggen, Gerrit van Honthorst and Dirk van Bebern. And these are brilliant Dutch golden age painters who were self-consciously deriving their aesthetic approach directly from Caravaggio, okay? So let's begin the workshop as I continue this introduction. So think about Rembrandt, think about Velasquez. You can't really understand the emotive depth and viscerally painted facial expressions without really appreciating the impact that Caravaggio's artwork made on painting by the time we get to to Rembrandt. Painting has changed because of Caravaggio and Rembrandt wouldn't have painted in the manner that he did were it not for the impact that Caravaggio made in his brief career. Think also of Diego Velasquez, a painter who's born in 1599 and who lives up until the mid 17th century. His dramatic and theatrical narrative paintings, his theatrical genre paintings, heavily influenced by Caravaggio. Caravaggio transforms genre painting in the early 17th century and changes the way that it's approached in terms of its naturalism and its emotional realism, the, 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 the convincing and compellingly believable manner in which he depicts human emotions within a narrative scene transforms genre painting. Painters there after Caravaggio feel that they need to make their paintings more convincing, more authentic, more directly worked after nature, to mimic nature, to make their art closer to nature in terms of its expression of human emotions and human movement and human feeling and passion. Caravaggio changes painting forever. And it does begin here in this painting, where he's painting his own feelings, his own illness, perhaps. So what was it that Caravaggio did that was so different and so radical, so revolutionary? 
did he just evolve out of the natural development of painting within the trajectory of artistic ideas, beginning with Cimabue at the start of the Renaissance and culminating with Titian and Tintoretto and Giorgione in the 16th century? Did he just evolve out of that great tradition or were there certain things that he did were at, that actually completely broke with the tradition and broke out of that trajectory into an entirely new epoch, which he begins? That's the question that we'll be exploring in this series. And I think that today we're going to see him as part of an evolution and look at some ideas that really are new with Caravaggio, okay? So what was it that he did differently? Well, his figures are painted from life. That's something that was relatively modern in Caravaggio's time. It broke from a historical approach to painting that had existed since the Middle Ages. Think about Italian painting dominated by a Byzantine influence up until Cimabue and Giotto. And think about medieval illuminated manuscripts. These are paintings and designs and images that are not modeled from life. They're modeled from pre-existing modello and model books. And they are not draw images that are based on observation. They don't have that immediate essence of a response from life to them. And they're not distinctly naturalistic. Painting from life had really begun with the Venetian painters. Even artists like Leonardo da Vinci and Michelangelo wouldn't paint from life. You couldn't imagine Michelangelo having life models with him up on the scaffolds in the Sistine Chapel during 1508 up until 1512 when he's painting the Capella Sistina ceiling. He was working from drawings. Michelangelo's um, Mona Lisa, he didn't paint that directly from life. He painted that. It's partly an evolution of paint itself and his sort of ongoing imagination and letting the paint sort of you know it's an experimental artwork to an extent working from countless drawings and the the paint evolving as his conception of the image unfolds and develops but painting from life was something that began really in the 16th century in the lombard tradition and the venetian school giorgioni had innovated in the opening years of the 16th century a manner of painting that didn't rely on pre-existing drawings or may have utilized pre-existing drawings but didn't rely on a, on a on an underlying design where the paint was built up in layers of paint without an underdrawing and this painting really really is rooted in that Giorgione-esque tradition of painting on canvas directly onto the ground without an underdrawing. And here Caravaggio may well have used a mirror and painted this painting directly from life without recall to any drawings whatsoever. That is something that really in this form begins with Giorgione. And that's why Giorgione is one of the most important painters of all time. So painting from life. What does that mean, though? What does painting from life do to an artwork? Why does painting from life make a painting different? Well, painting from life can make painting more naturalistic because when you're observing a living form and when you're painting directly from a living form, the poses are not inventions of your imagination. If you look at manneristic paintings by artists like Rosso Fiorentino, Bacchio Bandinelli, Giorgio Vasari, Jacopo Pontormo, or post-Renaissance painters like Andrea del Sarto, 
the drawings are based from life. But when it comes to painting, they are exaggerated and often idealized or stylized if you're a mannerist. Michelangelo and Leonardo and painters of their generation or their era in the Renaissance proper going into the high Renaissance, drawings may be executed to an extent from life, but the fantasia, the imagination and the intellect plays a big part in inventing figurative designs in conjunction with observation. But working directly from nature as the primary visual resource enables artists to interact with real life in a more direct and immediate way, making the poses more convincing. You can't imagine and invent something more natural than human nature itself. And that is what really transformed and makes Caravaggio's painting so different, is that working from life and capturing the real movement of a living figure, or the real pose of a living figure, obviously a painting is a still image, but they imply movement, they imply an action within the body. And when, when, a, when, a, when a pose or a, or a representation of a pose implies movement or reflects an action of a living body, the movement detecting networks in the human mind perceive movement subconsciously. And that's what makes them so exciting. That's what makes dynamic, visually representational art exciting. And it, that's what really enables paintings to speak of narratives and tell stories. So when your painting is based on real life, that injects the image with something more immediate, more natural and more compelling one could argue. So with Caravaggio, he paints after nature, he paints directly from life with the intention of conveying the psychological state of the subject to convey their intent. And it didn't begin with Caravaggio. That in and of itself didn't begin with Caravaggio. In Leonardo's notebooks, when it, in the sections of Leonardo's notebooks that were intended to be comprised within a, a treatise on painting, Leonardo emphasizes the, the necessity to depict the motions of the mind and the intellect and the intentions within the mind in the figurative designs. But his Leonardo's sketches were based from life but his paintings were not executed directly from life. By the time we're in Caravaggio's time, the approach to painting in this region had really developed and Caravaggio is a part of radicalizing these new developments in painting from life and painting from nature. Caravaggio is able to paint emotions and feelings ranging from delight to ecstasy, to agony, to fright, to horror, to being petrified, to being violently angry and to be carrying out, to being angry and violent enough to be carrying out killing. So Caravaggio is able to paint all of these things directly from life. And then he would probably work up the paintings and model them to an extent in the absence of his models but Caravaggio began the paintings and developed the paintings in the presence of life models in his studios. Above and beyond the expressions of the moving figure, there are the facial expressions, the physiology of human emotion expressed in the human face, the way that a face will express the feelings and passions that are gripping the mind that being observed directly from life and then painted is so much more expressive and immediate than merely inventing or trying to illustrate these feelings and emotions from one's own creative mind. 
but drawing them directly from nature is going to enable the imagination to let go of trying to imagine these things, but just to perceive them in nature and represent them. The, you know, nature has got all of the potential expressions and realities within it without the need for you to imagine or reimagine them. So painting them from nature can be incredibly empowering for the artist. There's also a sense of noise in Caravaggio's paintings with the faces writhing in pain sometimes or breathing in ecstasy. You can hear the inhales and the exhales and the shouts and the screams because of the powerful way in which Caravaggio is able to paint them. So with Caravaggio, there aren't only portraits, there aren't only figures that he painted, but also genre paintings, paintings with numerous figures interacting. And he paints them, one of the things that he does differently is paint them as though these figures and narratives are not just on a stage remote from the real world. He brings us closer to the painted world. In this painting here, in this very, very early painting here, we're separated from Caravaggio himself, who he's paint, you know, he's painting himself as Bacchus, Bacchus unwell, Bacchus sick. And he's got this stone plinth between us and him. And his elbow is there just hovering above that stone, just above that still life, grapes and peaches. And this is really interacting with the great Venetian and Lombard tradition of portraiture, but he's taking the portrait subject, he's taking the, the sort of aesthetic composition of a por portrait and turning it into an allegory or genre painting by painting himself as a mythological being. In terms of our distance from him, we feel as though we could be leaning on that same plinth, but yet that plinth still creates a sense of uh, a visual barrier, a distinction between our world and the world of the painted beings within it and the painted objects within it. What Caravaggio would do later in his career, quite shortly after painting this, within a decade, within the 1590s even, and especially by the early 1600s, is he would break away that separation between the painted world and the real world. And that is one of the things that really made Caravaggio different and stand out. So we found three ingredients so far, figures painted from life, the, the viscerality of the facial expressions, and the removal of the sense that we're looking onto a stage from an audience, but are rather within the stage with the painted world, within that painted world. Another element that Caravaggio is very famous for, which we hear very often when we listen to discussions on Caravaggio, on, I don't know, at art school or a university studying the history of art or on documentary series or whatever, is chiaroscuro. That is what scholars and people who are interested in the history of art credit Caravaggio with inventing, with inventing chiaroscuro. I mean, that is, Caravaggio did really new things with chiaroscuro, but he didn't invent it. Chiaroscuro simply means the dynamics of light and shade and the interplay of shadows and the relationship between the shadows and the lights within that scale of darks and lights, within every mode, within the spectrum of lights and darks. So artists a century earlier, artists like, um, or in, uh, earlier in the 16th century, artists like Giorgio Vasari, when writing about artists and their approaches, sometimes describes um, a Leonardo drawing, for example, as being executed in chiaroscuro, a drawing being executed in dark and light, meaning that Leonardo executed his drawing with uh, washes of ink, 
simply in a study of contrasts, of tonal contrasts. So chiaroscuro existed, but what Caravaggio does with chiaroscuro is quite remarkable. Now, this painting has got a very, very dark background. And there are really, really incredibly, incredibly beautifully modeled lights in the painting. So the painting has dramatic chiaroscuro. But so do some of Leonardo's paintings. So do many of Tintoretto's paintings. So did Caravaggio's first teacher's paintings, Simone Petazzano. Petazzano had, he was, he was a good painter and he painted with really dramatic chiaroscuro. But what Caravaggio does differently in some examples is uses chiaroscuro to paint symbols into the painting because the shadows create an impression of a visual phenomenon like a halo here or a fish there. Another thing that Caravaggio does differently with chiaroscuro is his consistency with the light source. The cast shadows are observed from an actual light source and so if you look at an earlier painting by an artist from the high renaissance there won't be the cast shadows that conform to the direction of light. Caravaggio brings another level of realism into his paintings by having cast shadows all conform to the direction of light. And so where there is a form obstructing the passage of light, it will generate a shadow, a cast shadow on a subsequent form. Here you can see the cast shadows of Caravaggio's locks of hair on his brow. And you can distinguish the individual shadows of bits of hair from the hair itself. These are really brilliant things that Caravaggio did. Now, Titian was great at handling light and creating a sense of reflectedness on shiny surfaces with light highlights. And the use of chiaroscuro in Florentine and in Lombard and in Venetian and in Roman drawings throughout the Renaissance utilized a dynamic scale of light and dark. But the attention to the real shadows and using real shadows that conform to the single naturalistic light source to this level is completely original. So there is an extent already that we can see, you know, these four things, chiaroscuro, figures painted from life, facial expressions, and, uh, you know, compositionally bringing us into the painting. Within those four things, we can see that Caravaggio is both interacting with a pre-established tradition or a set of pre-established traditions, but is also a revolutionary. Okay, so he's revolutionary within these traditions, so to speak even at this stage. Okay, so to have a still life painted with such delicacy and detail this early on, quite remarkable. And that facial expression, the ambiguity of it, very Georgiani-esque, the fact that he's holding a bunch of grapes up to his, to his mouth and the grapes look almost as pale and his, some of them are really rotting. Maybe we ought to take a closer look. Let's take a closer look at the face now, everyone. So we look here, we can see that the grapes are really brilliant. You know, when you have a bunch of grapes and you get that, that chalky, um, that chalky complexion on the outer skin of the grapes, that is rendered so exquisitely. And also there is a, a, an off grape and there are malformed grapes in that little bunch there. And it's that attention to the decay of natural forms, which is incredibly new and really, really striking and impressive. When a, someone walking by a painting and sees something that really does echo nature, it's very, very impressive intuitively. We love it to recognize a likeness of something and to be able to say that that looks real. That is something that we've recognized as being a you know, to observe a likeness and recognize something, that is a source of pleasure. And it's been acknowledged 
since Aristotle. In Aristotle's Poetics, he recognizes and he explicitly outlines that there is an intuitive inbuilt pleasure in perceiving a resemblance between one thing and another. And if we look at the classical literature on paint, if we look at Pliny the Elder and his account of Apelles, Apelles paint, painting a bunch of grapes so real that even birds came to peck at it, you know, tricking nat nat painting, mimicking nature to such an extent that nature itself or herself is tricked. That, that's, you know, so that's what Caravaggio is doing with that bunch of grapes there. And he's lifting that bunch of grapes to his mouth to nourish himself. He's also the god of wine. He's Bacchus with an, ivory, with an ivy wreath around his head, an ivy crown. His head tilting back there sensually, comically, kind of crazily as well. That head tilting back to address us um, engages the viewer in a dynamic way, but also the inclination of the head is very evocative and makes us see that the figure is in here in a state of passion. The head tilting back like that is indicative of ecstasy, some form of carnal, carnal feeling. Okay, so that's what Caravaggio is doing here. And it is quite striking. This is one of his very, very early paintings. And while you're drawing from this one, I'm just going to continue giving a continue giving a brief background of Caravaggio's life. Okay, so God, I've covered a lot already, actually. Um, there are lots of things that he does that are totally different, including the chiaroscuro. But what I think he is most compelling in his work, the most important things in his work, is that his paintings, his genre paintings, his, well, it's mostly genre paintings. Some of them really borrow from portraiture. Some of his genre paintings, they borrow from half length portraiture as well. What he does that is so unique is paint is he paints them as though they're actually happening before your eyes. These scenes, they, he paints them as though they are genuinely happening before their life, as though you were there. Just like in this painting, he interacts with you in a very personal way, in a very, very, in a way which is very emotionally charged or, you know, charged with, with feeling. He paints even the most elevated scenes, martyrdoms of saints and images of Christ, you know, images of the passion of Christ, the Eka Homo, the flagellation, the crowning of thorns and etc. cetera. He, and the, 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 the arresting of Christ, when Judas betrays Christ, the betrayal of Christ, which is in Dublin, he paints these things and puts you so close to them that it's almost as though you're a part of the crowd he, he actually enables you to feel as though you are in that scene. That is, and, and he uses people who look like they're real people. He paints people that he knew, that he saw in the marketplace, that he found and brought into his studio to paint. And he paints them not just as they would appear in the narrative, but he paints them as they actually were, ordinary people. And that's what makes Caravaggio so completely sublime is that he paints these elevated genre scenes as though they're happening for real in his own time. And I think that to experience Caravaggio, to really witness the revolutionary nature of Caravaggio, you would have to go back to the late 1590s and early 1600s and be informed by 16th century painting, to be familiar with 16th century painting from the perspective of someone who was there at the time and then see Caravaggio for the first time. That's the only way to truly witness Caravaggio. It's too late for us now because we are so too, we're familiar with Caravaggio. He's shaped everything we've seen. He's impacted painting that we've seen. The only, the true, only true witness of Caravaggio is someone who saw it in its own time to really appreciate the impact and the 
completely revolutionary nature of it. The only true witnesses of Caravaggio's revolutionary genius were his contemporaries. Okay, because that, and, and, and one of the reasons for that is because the way in which it's, his paintings are executed, they show his contemporary world in contemporary clothing and in contemporary lighting with the people that were there at the time. And he paints them and, and all of that to convey a holy and sacred narrative. So I think that we can appreciate it for being revolutionary genius, but to actually witness it, we would have to actually go back in time or, have, or we would have had to have been there. So revolutionary, radical, brilliant genius. He did, however, take a great deal of influence from the Lombard Veneto tradition, as I've mentioned already. And as I talk about that, let's look at the still life. Because it's fabulous. Look at that. Black grapes, they look healthier. He's got the unhealthy looking grapes. And these two peaches look very good. He did take influence from the Lombard Veneto tradition. And from that tradition, he drew ideas and influence from painters like Giorgione, who I've already mentioned, from Titian and Tintoretto, who I've both already mentioned. Giovanni Bellini, okay, so Bellini, who was a uh, Venetian painter, the chief painter in Venice until Titian superseded him. Giovanni Battista Moroni and Moretto di Brescia, who were two great Lombard portrait painters. And in terms of the chiaroscuro, the Lombard Benito style of drawing and painting had a greater emphasis on chiaroscuro than it did on linear design. We think of the importance of linear design and the primacy of the line. We really think of the Florentine school. In Florentine drawing and Florentine painting, the line is really the beginning and the end of the image. With Lombard draftsmanship and Venetian draftsmanship, they generally work far more on toned paper and they work with far softer media. We do not have many metal point drawings. We've got some Gentile Bellini metal point drawings, silver point drawings, but we don't have any by Titian or Tintoretto. In the north, in the Lombard school and in the Venetian school, drawing media were selected for their ability to create areas of tone. And Venetian draftsmen, like Tintoretto, would use shapes of shadows and tonal modeling to conjure a likeness of a form. In Florentine drawing, different approach, line. The Florentine approach to drawing is incredibly linear. Shading is important. If you look at Florentine drawing after the Pollaiolo brothers and after Mazzo Frina Guerra and after Andrea del Verrocchio, Florentine drawings are always going to be modeled with a sculptural plasticity. But Tone is not the primary aesthetic or the dominating aesthetic quality in the drawing. Whereas in the Lombard and Venetian school, it, that is more the case. And so that is the background that Caravaggio is really spawning from. Now the Lombard school, was influenced by artists that I've mentioned, Benini, Mantegna, Giorgione, Titian, and etc. But also another artist was actually influenced very, very, very profoundly by a Florentine, one of the most famous Florentines ever, Leonardo da Vinci. 
You'll remember from several weeks ago now, we did a three part series on Leonardo, which was before I was uh, recording the workshops to put on YouTube. I would redo Leonardo again at some point and uh, I will put it on YouTube. Um, the, the, sub, the next series, which I may, may, may do one this year, maybe next year. Um, but Leonardo, as you will remember, if you attended the, those workshops, um, was in Milan from the 1480s. And what Leonardo brought to the Lombard School are the things that we've touched on recently. Thinking about the physiology of expression, of emotion expressed through the human face, and the prerequisite of expressing the action and intent and the movements of the mind within the figurative design in, in a, you know having to convey a psychological state in the image of the figure these are things that leonardo really really emphasized when he was in milan and were profoundly influential on the development of the lombard school he also made lin uh, some lombard drawings more linear as well, if you think of Francesco Melzi, and if you think of the uh, um, De Predis brothers, and if you think of the master of the Palace Fort Sesca, these are all Lombard artists who were part of Leonardo's circle while in Milan, and he, he had a profound impact on them, and they in turn had an impact on the, on the future course of the Lombard tradition. So also Leonardo influenced the use of chiaroscuro, Leonardo was a big advocate of using tone to model a form effectively and to bring a form into relief. For Leonardo, tone is about making a form more visible and light and dark and the contrast of light and dark, in other words, chiaroscuro, the dynamics of shade and light, are there and are necessary to make a three-dimensional form appear as three-dimensional in relief on a two-dimensional surface in a painting or drawing. For Leonardo, his theory of optics has chiaroscuro as one of its central principles. Our vision of form is dependent on contrasts in qualities of light and dark. And so he brings that to the Lombard School and that's a big part of Caravaggio's development. So the modeling of the dynamics of light and shade to illuminate figures and narrative. That is something that Leonardo brought to the Lombard School in which Caravaggio is heavily, heavily um, rooted in and he develops on that development. So Caravaggio responds to all of that um, from Giorgione not being reliant on drawing to painting people from ordinary life. But also in Giorgione has another sort of poetic influence and that is in the status of the painting itself and the painting being valid as a poetic expression of feeling, emotion, and philosophical depth without the specific identity of the people depicted being of primary importance. So that is something that Giorgione introduced, the idea of the painting itself having its own poetic value independently of the individual identity of the people depicted within it. In doing that, Giorgione unlocked the poetic and expressive potential of painting. And the, this is another thing, yet another thing, that Caravaggio appears to be very sensitive to, aware of, and consciously building on. So there, lots of things that influenced him um, that we've discussed. And uh, this painting that we have been looking at is his self-portrait as Bacchus. It's one of his earliest, possibly his earliest painting that we know of. 
which he painted between 1593 and 1594, or either in 1593 or in 1594. So in the months after arriving, possibly within the months within him arriving in Rome in 1592, at the age of about 20. So he's about 20, 21, 22, when he painted this. And as I mentioned, he possibly had a very serious illness at the time and painted himself feeling and looking unwell. And he painted this painting, self-portrait is back as why he, while he was still in the workshop of his second or third employer in Rome, second main employer in Rome, um, who we are going to be talking about. And this painting was then in that painter's collection up until 1607 when it was seized by order of Pope Paul V. So, quite soon after this painting, quite soon after painting this painting, Caravaggio would be patronized and he would enter the household of an incredibly important patron called Cardinal Francesco Maria del Monte. And Del Monte uncovered Caravaggio's talents while he was working for Giuseppe Cesari, his second main employer. And would enable Caravaggio's career to develop to the heights that it would. And by 1599, Caravaggio was one of the most important artists in Rome, an influential artist in Rome, and by 1600 was one of the most sought after artists in Rome. So in a very short period of time, because of people like Cardinal Francesco Maria del Monte, Caravaggio's career would really be a successful one very quickly. And that has a great deal to do with all of the things that we've just been speaking about. And um, if it hadn't been for Caravaggio coming to Rome and starting to paint these sorts of peculiar paintings without a patron, without a pre-established buyer, then Del Monte would not have noticed him, perhaps. When Caravaggio was working and painting in the workshop of Giuseppe Cesari, more commonly referred to as Cavaliere de Arpino, who was a, a painter in Rome, who had a, a workshop in Rome. While Caravaggio was working for him, Caravaggio started to paint independent works for what we now know of as know of as a open market. In Rome was an, a growing open market where people from the upper tiers of society could see paintings for sale and find things that were of novel or original qualities. Caravaggio's works, early works from the early 1590s were visible in the art market, the open market, and Del Monte discovered him there. And this is while Caravaggio is still working in the workshop of De Arpino, Cavaliere de Arpino. Cavaliere d'Arpino would actually buy this painting. This painting was not bought by Del Monte, it was bought by Arpino. And Del Monte would purchase and commission 
paintings from Caravaggio's early career and would enable Caravaggio eventually to achieve the high status as an artist that he would, including facilitating his obtaining the commission for the Contarelli Chapel in the Chiesa de San Luigi de Francesi, which is the St. Matthew paintings, the free St. Matthew paintings. And that was the, the, his main first public commission. So it's really Cardinal Del Monte, Cardinal Del Monte, who is responsible for, partly responsible for us knowing who Caravaggio is. So thank you, him. Okay, so let's move on now, everyone. We're going to look at something else. And this is a brilliant one. Look at that. Okay, so this is The Musicians. And this is a painting that Caravaggio actually painted for Cardinal Del Monte in 1594 or 1595. And by this point, Caravaggio may have already have been in the household of Del Monte as a resident artist in the Palazzo of the Cardinal. And during the mid 1590s, Caravaggio was no longer a, an artist selling his paintings for the open market, trying to get work in various different art, artists' workshops. When he arrived in Rome, he was, you know, apparently employed by a Sicilian painter who no one's heard of called Lorenzo Carli. And then he was working in another painter's workshop, a sort of mannerist painter's workshop called Antiveduto Grammatica. And Grammatica would end up being heavily influenced by Caravaggio, even though he was far older than Caravaggio. Um, Cavaliere di Arpino was not too much older than Caravaggio um, and clearly recognized his talents because he did in fact purchase a number of early works from the artist under his employ. It's very interesting while the artist was not only working for him, but also painting independent works for the open market. And uh, this painting was commissioned by a cardinal. A cardinal who, you know, it's a very high position. A to be a cardinal is to be, to have a proximity to the Pope, basically the monarch of Christendom. Well, not at this point, the whole of Christendom, because the Reformation had happened, but within Catholic Christendom. And Cardinal de Monte had a position in the Curia, which is like the, the Pope's council, the decision making bodies of the, the church, the political institution within the Catholic Church. And here we've got four youths one playing and tuning a lute, the others, one playing with some fruit there, the other reading some music, possibly singing, the other singing, and he seems to have an instrument as well. He's got a horn. And the facial expressions of those two boys in the middle, the wateriness of the eyes, the mouth, is they're singing, but they're incredibly evocative of sensuality. And these boys are all, you know, they're in a very congested composition together. One of them is a Cupid and Cupid is Eros. So we have an explicit reference to the, of passionate love in Cupid, passionate love, erotic love. In mythology, in Greek mythology, there are four kinds of love, or in Greek philosophy as well. In traditional Hellenic culture, there are four kinds of love. Eros is the one which is the corporeal love, the, 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 the love of physical passions, which captures the mind. When the body captures the mind and we fall in love with things and have erotic feeling towards them. And Cupid is, is a symbol of that. And he is in there with these three other boys. And, and this is a cardinal. So this shows us that the Catholic hierarchy was not as 
books. I would say that it's more culturally interesting and intellectually and creatively open than many other sources of ideas today might make us think. Just recall a previous drawing from history workshop on Diego Velasquez. Diego Velasquez was taught by Francisco Pacheco. Francisco Pacheco was Seville's official censor for the Spanish Inquisition. He was a great painter who wrote a treatise on painting and who fostered Velasquez's pioneering approach to painting, to portraiture, to Christian narratives and to pagan narratives. The history of art illuminates so much more of the true character of European history than more academic or political or politicized sources of history. The history of art can show us and illuminate a lot of surprises about our own culture. And it's far more interesting than many people today give it credit for. So I would say that this Cardinal, Cardinal Del Monte, was interested in lots of different things. He had varied interests. He was an educated, erudite man and possibly enjoyed looking at really profoundly real sensuous images which we more commonly associate with modern art. He had good taste, okay? He had the insight and the taste and the prescience to recognize Caravaggio for being the remarkable, remarkably brilliant painter that he was. Here we've got a really sense, really got a sense of direct contact with this group. We're being looked at directly by two of the figures, by two of the faces. The central one who is in, who is closer to us is making direct eye contact with us, tilting his head slightly towards his left shoulder and his mouth is open like that. And we are very close to them. There's not much separating us from them. His knee is in reach. It's right at the bottom of the canvas. So there is no physical barrier between us and them as there was in the previous painting where Caravaggio is painting himself as Bacchus. So he's bringing us closer into the painted world. Is he bringing us into the painted world completely? Well, in term, if we're going to go by the gaze of the, the two subjects and we're going to go between and we're going to go for the go on the proximity between us and them, then yes. We are sharing the space. It's almost as though we are peering into a small room and we are among these uh, boys playing music. So what I would like to do now is take a closer look at their faces and give you a chance to see the expressions more closely and to draw from them. Here we are. So look, we can see the back of that boy's head there on the right. His hair is so realistic. In fact, all of the hair is realistic. And the, 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 the breeze blowing in that boy in the foreground's hair. So the boy in the middle playing the lute and tuning the lute, his hair seems to be blown back by something. Is it the wings of Cupid or is it us opening a door? Is there something in the dynamics of the figurative depiction of that boy that actually implies movement in the physical world outside of the painting? I could be reading into it too much and that might be a bit far, but his hair does seem to be 
flying back by something. That Cupid on the left is reminiscent of uh, a boy peeling fruit in a attribute painting com sometimes attributed to Caravaggio, uh, a slightly earlier painting. The boy looking down, handling those grapevines there. This could be a reference to an earlier composition painted by Caravaggio when he was slightly younger. Those wings are real wings as well. They're not fantasy wings. They are wings that look like they could be on an eagle. And Leonardo was an artist who introduced the painting of real wings rather than phantasmagorical or purely illustrative wings. If you th think back to Leonardo's Annunciation painting, the Archangel Gabriel has a, a real pair of, of wings rather than merely decorative fantastical wings. That Cupid's head is tilting downwards towards his hands and the grapevines. Two subjects in the very middle are looking straight at us as they're singing and the boy on the right is looking down at the sheet of music. And so there is a musicality to the painting. There, there are different signs of different sounds being made the voices singing, also the lute, the plucking of the strings and the tuning of the strings. The tuning of the string implies a level of discord, something not being quite right. An instrument not being entirely in tune as it should be. That could be uh, an illusion something in the situation or something in the discourse between the viewer and the painting. That can be left open to interpretation. Technically, the painting is astonishing. Caravaggio was a fantastic technician. His painting at this stage is generally executed on very fine linen. This doesn't look so fine. Painting would have been coated with a very thin layer of gesso and the first layers of underpainting would have probably been executed in egg tempera because it seals the gesso ground and it provides oil, subsequent layers of oil paint to absorb into the gesso rather than straight into and sinking into the, uh, sorry, it allows the oil to latch into the tempera rather than sinking directly into the gesso. Gesso is very sponge-like and absorbent and doesn't really protect the canvas itself enough from oil. And so the first layers make sense to work in tempera first, as Titian and Giorgione sometimes did in their early works. Well, Giorgione doesn't really have many mature works because he died in 1510 at, at a very young age. Whereas Titian in his later years probably painted directly in oils all the way through. So you can see in that red cloth, the use of three pigments. There's a red lake pigment, which could either be from rose madder or from cochineal. I suspect this is cochineal, which is an insect. It's a very historic pigment derived from crushed insect shells, cochineal insects. And they, that's where we get the red food dye from, or old school red food dye. That cochineal pigment or that red lake pigment either from cochineal or rose madder, is glazed. Caravaggio was a painter who utilized a traditional approach of glazing in oil paint in semi-transparent layers. And the shadows and the darks would be glazed on top of areas built up with more opaque colors, except for when the underpainting and the ground is dark enough to provide those shadows. Something that Caravaggio is really good at is combining both approaches, leaving the underpainting to create the shadows 
and glazing onto the underpainting to create the shadows, like in the boy's armpit. The boy on the right, his left armpit, that's in the dark areas, there's underpainting and then glazes on that underpainting to create the dark shadows. And then there is the more layered approach where which builds up color and then glazes on top of color to create the shadows. In the case of a red drapery, vermilion would usually be used in conjunction with lead white. So you'd paint the drapery in vermilion and in the light areas, you would mix the vermilion with lead white. And then when that was fully dried, you would glaze on top of it with transparent red, which would either be madder or cochineal. Sometimes the red would turn black in certain places. That's because sometimes vermilion was adulterated with other red pigments. Sometimes it was extended with red brick, which is a terrible thing to do. And at other times it's admixed with red lead, which can turn black on exposure to sulfur in the environment. Vermilion is a very slow drying pigment. It's mercury sulfide, which doesn't act as a catalyst in the drying of oil. Whereas lead is a very fast drying pigment and lead will act as a catalyst in the drying of oil that you use for painting, either walnut oil or linseed oil or poppy oil. And lead will act as a catalyst to that drying process. And so if you mix the vermilion with a little bit of lead white, it will help it dry. And if you're going to glaze on top of it, you need it to be dry. And so mixing a bit of lead in there would, uh, would, would, would help you in that process. A bit of underpainting is a beautiful use of underpainting is there in the lute and also underneath um, the red cloth here. The white brush strokes, opaque light paint painted directly onto that brown underpainting. That is really stunning. And that's something that you see with Giorgione. You can see the tone of the ground underneath these, this fabric there as well. That's the tone of the ground. In traditional painting, especially in Venice, the painting on the toned ground, the Venetian and Lombard school really developed on the approach of painting on a toned ground. That's artists like uh, Mantegna, Bellini, and then later on Titian and Giorgione. Painting on a toned ground and working from dark to light. Florentine's Florentine approach to drawing began on a white gessoed panel. So a panel made of poplar coated with several layers of gesso and then the colours would be worked from light to dark. Venetians and Lombards approached it in reverse. That's a simplistic binary distinction, which isn't, doesn't give full account to the variations within those two schools. Because sometimes you'll look at a, Ven a Florentine painting and they will make a similar use of the underpainting like that. And they would um, create an imprimatura or ground colour to seal the gesso, which would give it an, uh, a slightly darker or middle toned ground, middle ground. Okay, so what time is it now? How are we doing for time? I don't have any way of telling the time. Um, no, my mobile phone is over there, I'll just go and get it. Okay, so we've still got plenty of time. Okay, so this series, as I mentioned at the beginning, this series is going to traverse the years of Caravaggio's life from his birth in 1571 to his death in 1610. We're going to learn about his creative journey and what he did that amounted to an epochal contribution to the history of art. What have you been looking at today? In the two paintings we've seen so far already in this series, we've been looking at his early years. 
We've heard a little bit about his teachers, Simone Pitazzano, Antiveduto Grammatica, and Cavalieri da Arpino. We've heard about his making of his earliest independent works and getting discovered by Cardinal Francesco Maria del Monte. We've seen how he painted scenes of what may appear as nat natural human presence. Youths gripped by feeling, both himself and these musicians. We're going to see that he would also depict glimpses of the darker side of life and the darker side of his social environment, such as fortune telling, which is a superstitious activity. What he does, what he does in these paintings, he paints them as they are, as though they are really happening. And one of the things that Caravaggio did that really makes him stand out is his painting of everyday things in these early years, such as people playing cards and some of them cheating, the fortune teller, as I mentioned, and so on. These scenes of everyday plausible occurrences between people things that could plausibly be conceived as happening in real life. They were considered deeply interesting, deeply interesting by an educated elite in Rome at the time. They're a strikingly vivid sort of painting, very, very eye-catching and provocative, deliberately so. So what we're going to do now is look at our last painting, last painting, which was in the Del Monte collection alongside this one, which Del Monte commissioned. And we have here the fortune teller. This is the earlier one, which is in Rome still in the Musee Capitolini, and this is the this is the latest of these three paintings, and this is another one um, in the Del Monte collection. And what I would say about this is that this is a genre painting. We all remember what genre painting is because we've just done our series on Rubens. And it's so nice to be talking about a new artist who we haven't spoken about for so long. I may have spoken about Caravaggio, but we haven't done a workshop with him for a very, very long time. And um, we remember that genre painting was the art of telling a story, creating a narrative with a number of figures interacting. And genre painting was considered the most elite form of painting. It isn't a portrait, which is dependent on the individual identity of the sitter for its chief purpose. It isn't a still life, just depicting physical objects. It's a, it's a painting of a scene, telling a narrative. And what Caravaggio does is he really revolutionizes the genre painting by giving it the composition of a half length, portrait, very familiar in the Lombard tradition and in the Venetian tradition. And he uses the genre painting approach of telling a narrative to depict something from everyday life. And something as low brow as a lady telling a fortune in a street. Now this composition is strikingly and daringly simple. The background is plain. The only thing that establishes some aesthetic contrast in the background is the chiaroscuro, which is not particularly intense. This is early Caravaggio at his most 
simple. And I would say in, is most clever because he's taking a scene that would have been comical for a, an elite patron, potential patron. Now this painting is in a Del Monte collection. It could have been commissioned by Del Monte or it could have been painted for the open market and then purchased by Del Monte. But Caravaggio was in the household working for Del Monte at this time in the second half of the 1590s. And what would have interested someone like him is the fact that this is referencing theatre, elite men and women in Rome in the late 16th century enjoy theatre and dramatic art. And this painting interacts with theatre. We can see that the man on the right is a gentleman. He's wearing a sword. A sword would have been an incredibly valuable piece of personal property. And only a gentleman would have could have afforded and would have been permitted to wear a sword. He's a very young gentleman. And yet he's having his fortune told. Fortune tellers would not have been the wealthiest members of society. They would have been from the lower orders of society. And they would have told people's fortunes for coin to make a living to be able to buy bread and to be able to buy sustenance. So we have a gentleman having his palm read by a fortune teller here. And it's the sort of thing that a cardinal or a patron, a high, that you know, a high status individual would have found amusing, entertaining, and would have liked as a conversation piece. So what Caravaggio is doing is really revolutionizing the genre painting and using it for something completely different. An everyday scene that one could have seen in Rome at the time, and he's painted it in a way which has a theatrical and dramatic sense of performance to it. It's like a, a piece of theatre that one can hang in a space and entertain guests with. And for someone like Del Monte, who is a very social man who has a very, very high position within the Catholic papal hierarchy, society was very important. And being recognized as a patron of the arts was very important. And possessing paintings like this would have been a significant aspect of social life. An artist like Caravaggio gives a patron like Del Monte access to what a patron like him needs. And he gives it to him from a very authentic point of view because Caravaggio is an artist who has come from nowhere. Caravaggio was born in a town outside of Milan in 1571. His father was a man who worked with stone. He was a mason. Caravaggio was apprenticed to an artisan, Simone Petezzano, from the age of about 13. We were about four years before he leaves the north and comes to Rome, 1592. He works in at least three different artists' workshops, not making much of a living, painting still lives on compositions, finishing paintings or parts of paintings as an assistant to already established artists. So he is a working man. 
He is a craftsman, he's an artisan. And in being noticed by a patron like Del Monte, Del Monte is able to gain access and insight into areas of life that he'd never have contact with. So Caravaggio is a true artist of the sort that we consider to be a true artist, someone who has come from humble origins, who is then recognized for his brilliance because of his own talent and hard work and intelligence. And I'd say that this is one of the most intelligent paintings of his early work because it combines his understanding of genre painting with his ability to merge everyday life and the, the less glamorous side of everyday life with a theatrical aesthetic within a genre painting type from, a, from the perspective of someone that is from a low social background who would then become immensely famous and then would die really young. So I hope you're having fun drawing this amazing painting. And I would like to know if um, you've, any of you have got any, got any questions. A long and awkward silence. Oh, hi. Oh, I've just got a question. Who going, is it? Going right, it's Hugh. Here. Hi, Hugh. Going right back to your the very first painting. Yeah. Um, and you were, you know, drawing from life, and you were explaining it and showing how expressive the figures are. So yeah. would would he be asking models to act? I mean, how do you how how does he bring that that feeling is he is he inventing that or is he asking or is he drawing it from observation well of the first painting he's painting himself and so he's probably deliberately moving his body in a way and he, in in that painting he's probably learning himself by painting himself and using himself as a model the sorts of things he can say to models in order to get what he wants out of them and to get the expression that he wants to see in them. We know that Caravaggio would often use the same model. There are certain people who, whose likeness reoccurs in a number of his works. And some of the faces are very sort of brutish. And we think that Caravaggio may have actually liked people who had a very rugged, slightly asymmetrical and bruised face, just like he liked bruised and imperfect fruit. But I think that Caravaggio found people he liked the look of and wanted to paint and would work with them in the studio. And this is the time before a professional life model, you know, in a workshop practice in a workshop environment, people in the workshop would pose, people who were assistants and people who maybe were hired to pose and to be drawn from and, or painted from. But I suspect that Caravaggio didn't ask models to act or perform, although he may have done. He may have said, oh, well, you remember that pose in that painting or you remember that character in that play or do you remember that? Can you do something like that? He may have said that sort of thing. But the bottom line is, is that we can only speculate about this sort of question. We do have knowledge that he worked directly from live models and that he worked with models, some models repeatedly, but that sort of discourse and relationship will remain elusive to us unless more findings are made in archives and diaries and letters and that sort of thing. It would only be through testimony and biography that we could learn um, that sort of detail about his interaction with the models. I would imagine he would have told them what to do and if, he would have probably physically moved them around. I don't know if you've seen Derek Jarman's film on Caravaggio from the 1980s. 
Yes. It's good, isn't it? Yes. It's brilliant. Derek Jarman was brilliant. And um, in that film, that Jarman reimagines Caravaggio's working process and Caravaggio is this complete nightmare who physically grabs models and puts things in their mouths and um, torments them. Brilliant film. Brilliant film, actually. I'd recommend it. But yeah, um, to learn more about that, maybe that's something we can discuss next week as well. His work, his methods of working from life. I'll see what I can do for you to answer that question more fully next week. How about that? Yeah, thank you. That's really interesting. Cool. Well, everyone, I really hope all of you enjoyed the workshop today. And I'm actually really looking forward to seeing some of your drawings. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to end it there. Thank you all very much. I loved it tonight. Caravaggio is one of my favourites. He's obviously one of your favourites too. And um, yeah, um, thank you very much for joining. I really hope you all enjoyed it. Thank you very, very much indeed. And there we go. Stop recording.